JS 2021 का रिजल्ट आया है कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन टू ऑल दोस्ट कैंडिडेट क्वालिफाइड द एग्जाम और वो सारे बच्चे जिनका कुछ मार्क्स से रह गया है यू शुड नॉट लूज हार्ट दिस इज अन गोइंग स्ट्रगल आपका एक और मेन्स होगा यू नो यू शुड कीप ऑन स्ट्रगलिंग अंटिल यू रीच योर फाइनल ऑब्जेक्टिव एंड योर गोल हैविंग सेट दैट क्विंटेशन से वी हैव हैड मोर देन 18 सिलेक्शन इन दिस एग्जाम टोटल आपके पोस्ट 180 के करीब थे uh, तो 20 के करीब बच्चे हमारे इंस्टीट्यूट uh, से हैं uh, जिनका हम कुछ वीडियोज आपके साथ शेयर करने वाले हैं Uh, ये उनके कुछ इंटरव्यूज है जो ऑलरेडी सिलेक्टेड कैंडिडेट्स है होप यू एंजॉय द सेशन यही वाला प्रेजेंट है आई आई थिंक सो दे दे इफ इफ दे डोंट सिलेक्ट यू इट शुड बी गोइंग टू बी अ लॉस फॉर यू इट इज गोइंग टू बी अ लॉस फॉर द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन दैट्स व्हाट आई कैन टेल यू प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस योरसेल्फ सो माय नेम इज अप्राजिता आर्य आई एम फ्रॉम डिस्ट्रिक्ट जम्मू I have done bachelor's in commerce honors and master's in economics both from University of Jammu so thereafter I started to prepare for civil services examination mm-hmm. uh, so my interests are dancing and working out and apart from that sir I love to spend my leisure time with family and friends What is the meaning of your name? Sir, so, so Prajita is taken from a Sanskrit word, and it literally translates to somebody who cannot be destroyed or mm-hmm. cannot be defeated. So it means a Parajit, just be Parajit nahi pai ja sakti. So that's the meaning. And do you have any nicknames as well? Because it, it yes. is a word quite difficult to pronounce. Yes, sir, I do have one. Uh, so it ma. people uh, generally call me gunjan okay okay you have this word aryan after your uh, name yes sir uh, do, 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 don't you think it's high time that we should actually shun these practices and do not call, call ourselves these aryans because this thing is taken very offensive in the western world given yes, given, given the given the linkages it had with the nazi racial ideology yes sir so actually the idea was not uh, so in my case i would say it does not pertain to any ethnicity race or caste name as such it is just my last name which my parents uh, thought it would uh, look aesthetically also nice with my name and also because maybe they were driven more towards the meaning of the word aryan if we go back to the uh, the purans in the vedic uh, literature the word uh, literally translates to somebody who's a noble person or righteous and the word was also used for lord ram uh, mm-hmm. and it, it is mostly it was mostly used in the sense that uh, uh, now as we use mr shri so it was just like used like that it was uh, when the max miller came with his rn invasion theory and then it was uh, used for uh, extermin- extermination of the nazi german population and and was popularized by uh, hitler and the holocaust came then i think maybe it the meaning of the thing became a lot more controversial and lot that so but in indian context i would say sir it was never uh, pertaining to any racial or ethnic communities per se but but there are uh, some other meanings to the name as well because this this word in sanskrit does, does not only mean noble it also means superior and high born yes, yes yeah so uh, how would you react to that so i think uh, everything has its flip sides and everything would uh, somewhere mean uh, nice or somewhere would have a derogatory thing for example if we talk about the word tribe uh, we may use it for some uh, literal purposes for academic purposes but then it also can hurt the sentiments of other people so i think sir the intent is what that matters and that is what i feel sir yeah What is your birth date? So it is fourth of October. It's two days after uh, the birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. Um, is there any significant event on that particular day apart from uh, the Gandhi Jayanti that we celebrate? So on second of October. Yeah. So it is uh, our second Prime Minister's birthday as well, Lal Bahadur Shastri ji. Mm-hmm. So, so that is one, and. Uh, okay. 
I'm sorry, sir, if there is any significant event, I am not able to celebrate right now. Is, is there any international day that we celebrate on that day? So on 2nd of October? Yeah. So I'm unable to recall right now. It is international day of non-violence, uh, okay, given, given, given the fact that Gandhiji, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a uh, you know, supporter of non-violence. Do, do you really think that uh, Gandhiji was a was was non-violent because at times uh, it is recorded that he has uh, voraciously supported violence uh, in some circumstances. Do you really think he was non-violent? Yes, sir. I would say that he was a non-violent uh, person, and because of the fact, sir, like uh, if we talk and go back to our uh, uh, literature, our books. Sir, it is believed that sometimes to eradicate the evil or to eradicate something which is uh, have, uh, something bad in the society, sometimes even being violent is better than being a coward person. So I don't think in extreme situations when you need to be, you need to be taking a stand and if you don't take a stand, being a, be a coward. So I think it is not uh, very advisable. So sometimes uh, even violence can uh, be something that you can take up, but not in the normal or daily routine or any uh, place where we have alternatives to it. So I think Sir Gandhiji was a, a largely non-violent person. And if ever he would resort to any kind of violence, I, I would not see him uh, having a very radical violent streak to him. It would be a very something, maybe he would vocalize something and he would never resort to something which is not uh, uh, in, inherent to his character. Okay. You know, uh, we earlier had a discussion about Aryan race and all that. Uh, he, Gandhiji was also uh, a believer in the Aryan Brotherhood. And uh, in that context, do you, do you think that he, he was a racist somehow? So I would not call him racist because uh, one of the, the theories that was uh, floated around in the Indian subcontinent of the caste also has its roots to the Aryan culture and whether Aryans came to India or not. And then the whole story of how the caste system developed through the, the Aryans uh, winning over the Dasyus or the Aborigines or the indigenous populations of India. So when he was a great supporter of caste, caste system. So I think if, if he was talking about Aryan Brotherhood, he was talking about the caste and the, uh, the solidarity that a caste uh, shares with each other. So maybe in the, that context, but I would not call him racist because he definitely worked hard uh, to eradicate the apartheid system, the slavery system in the South Africa, and but, he but was... there, there, there is an opinion that uh, the the the, the, move, the movement that had started against the apartheid in South Africa it was long before Gavin Gandhiji arrived in South Africa. Even even his grandson, uh, even his grandson and his biographer has said that uh, he was undoubtedly, and these these are the words that he has used. He is uh, he was un, un, undoubtedly prejudiced against black Africans when he first arrived in South Africa? So, but uh, yes, definitely so. Uh, but then there was a change of heart. And so I also feel that uh, if, if we talk about India, so we already know the, the perils that come with the, the extreme caste system like untouchability. But sir, even till today, after so much of constitutional safeguards has been given, that societal thought has prevailed. I will not say, uh, I will not generalize to the fact that everybody believes that way, but there, there needs to be that change. So sir, if he started uh, to eradicate uh, or, or work towards uh, uh, change of his heart and work towards uh, for the other people, the black uh, colored people, sir, it, 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 it doesn't matter when he started because uh, even till today, that thought prevails. So if somebody starts today and because the consciousness is, uh, uh, has come some hundred years back, it doesn't matter till the time that thing is not eradicated from its roots. So sir, even till today, we talk about Black Lives Matter and what uh, the kind of uh, racism that prevails in the other subcontinents. So even if today somebody starts and works towards it, I think he would deserve equal respect for that. 
So where do you align yourself? Do you align towards uh, his approach to caste system or do you align towards what Ambedkar uh, has maintained regarding that system? So regarding caste system, I would say that I lean more towards uh, the thoughts of Ambedkar uh, Sahab because, sir, I feel that, uh, uh, sir, being a student of anthropology also, so I feel that caste system per se, I would not uh, term it uh, that it was a bad kind of thing. But when it became uh, the caste mobility stopped and when the occupational rigidity came in it and with that, the, the ostracization of some particular communities and so where, where should we uh, put the tribals in that system and other religions in that system is a problematic issue. And when India talks about being a very uh, secular in its character and that is also enshrined in the preamble and other parts of our constitution. So I feel that uh, the rigidity that comes with the caste system per se so is something which I do not feel that I'm aligned towards. And uh, that is the problematic thing with it. Right. Was he ever given a Nobel Peace Prize? So, Gandhiji? So I'm not sure, but I don't think. So was he ever nominated for that? So I will have to go back and check. I'm not sure about that. Okay. All right, uh, you, you, what is your mother tongue? So it is Dogri. Okay. Tell me what Dogri as a language, uh, ha, uh, the feature of Dogri as a language has common with other Pahari languages. So uh, they all come from the basic uh, Indo-European uh, and indo aryanic languages. So that mm -hmm. is one thing that is common. Apart from that, sir, I would say the root words, some root words are similar between these Pahari languages. The tonality, I would say that is also similar. So if I'm talking to somebody who's from maybe some other Pahari language, I'll be able to understand because the root words, the tonality are more or less similar to each other. Okay, can you name any Dogri, uh, famous Dogri poet? Yes, sir. So uh, Padmashri, uh, Padma Sachdeva ji, she has mm -hmm. been uh, a great poet and she has written many uh, poems like Meri Kavita, Meri Geet. So then we have the father of uh, Dogri language, Ramna Shastri ji, he's also received the Padma Shri. So we have Nilambar Shiv Sharma ji also, he's also Padma Shri. Are you aware of this uh, uh, book that was recently released by LG? Uh, in, in the UD of Jammu and Kashmir uh, by the name of Udan Khadola. So I, I think I read about it somewhere, but I'm not uh, able to recollect it right now. Okay. Can you tell me, uh, is Dogri part of the 8th schedule? Yes, sir, it is part of the 8th schedule. Which amendment added Dogri into so, the 8th schedule? So it was added via 92nd Constitutional Amendment Act of 2003 with the uh, three other languages, uh, so Bodo, mm -hmm. Bodo, Maithili and Santhali. You're a master's in economics from Jammu University. Yes, sir. Uh, what, what, what inspired you to go for economics? So when I took uh, commerce in my 11th standard, so economics mm -hmm. was one of the subjects. And so even after my graduation, I wanted to go for economics honors only. But at that time, University of Jammu wasn't uh, offering any course like that. So I, I took a bachelor's in commerce honors. But sir, I had that uh, instinct of studying economics from the higher secondary itself. So why didn't you take, uh, take economics as your optional in JKPSC? Sir, so, um, in 2018, I completed my master's. And that time, uh, there were two subjects. Uh, before that, there were two subjects. So I thought one would be economics and other would be some other subjects. So I thought maybe anthropology. But when I began to study anthropology, so I feel a lot of my interest grew in the subject. So I wanted to further pursue that subject for my optional. Okay. Is it because of your interest or anthropology being uh, one of those optionals that are more scoring in nature? So scoring, I would say even public administration is scoring. 
sociology is a scoring subject, but that wasn't the idea behind that. Uh, anthropology aligned with my interests because I feel that uh, I wanted to study about the tribal communities. I wanted, there was a biological part uh, attached to it. So I was, uh, I was uh, lean towards, uh, I thought that it would uh, suit me. And so I think I wanted to study about some social study subject I wanted to study. So I thought it the, would give me. Tell me how your background in economics has helped you in, st in the study of anthropology. So economics is all about making choices in the scarce uh, resources that we have. And so when we are talking about humans, humans, uh, a very big part of hum humanity and everything, be it its environment or anything is how to harness those resources for the humanity. So, so economics is uh, something which is which has to come when we are studying the resource, the optimal utilization of it. So, so I think when we talk about tribals or the modern uh, modern uh, societies, how the economics has shaped the environment, their ecology, the way they live. So, I think it's all economics. Okay, let's see. Uh, uh, let me ask you some questions about economics. Can you can you define very precisely uh, what a demand is? Sir, demand. Uh, I would say, sir, something which is uh, needed by or or required by the society would be demand. Okay, so this society needs. Uh, let's suppose every other person in the Kashmir needs a Lamborghini. Uh, would you consider that a demand? No, sir. Then, so they, what is then the they should be purchasing uh, power also attached to it. Okay. okay, tell me what is production possibility for India? Sir, I'm not able to uh, recall the phenomena properly. But sir, I think it is... Uh, about if there are two uh, things in an industry, if I talk about at micro level, if there is product A and product B, I think, sir, uh, the, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not able to recall properly. Okay, you, you, we, we've talked about demand. Uh, you know, there are these two market forces of demand and supply that ensure uh, that, that the products reach to their consumers at their desired market price. Uh, but does market ensure social justice? So, um, if we purely talk about capitalistic forces, I would say no. But if there is an intervention by the government, like in a mixed economy kind of a situation, I would say yes. So, when India got independence, uh, what was the economic system that we acquired? So, we uh, definitely acquired the mixed eco economic model only. But it was more leaning towards the socialistic principles just to satisfy the social justice that was required because at the time of post uh, the independence, our, uh, the, the level of uh, poverty that was there, it was very high and so was the inequality. So to plug in those gaps and we were a very, uh, uh, we were exploited economy. So that's why government took in its hand the the idea of providing people with welfare and it is also enshrined in our dpsps of like so our article 48 it provides okay. for so sir that time we had a mixed economic model today also we have the mixed economic model but with the uh, 1991 reforms of liberalization privatization and globalization i would say the economy has opened more and we are now uh, the the balance has shifted to being a uh, more uh, balanced economy where government intervention is also there and capital forces are also working. Okay, you mentioned the LPG reforms. Can you tell me, after the LPG reforms, uh, do you think that the ro role of the Planning Commission was not that relevant anymore? So, I would not... Uh, say that because uh, sir, as we say that Niti Ayo today is also uh, a, uh, a, an organization that has taken on the role of planning commission with a little more organizational uh, 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 hierarchy, a uh, proper uh, vision, I would say. But sir, uh, planning commission or be it the Niti Ayo today was always leaning more towards how we, the government has to act as a facilitator. 
so maybe after that the the government acting as a regulator uh, would have stopped but the facilitative action of the government has not stopped until the time the government uh, we are a mixed economic model where a government has taken on the responsibility of the welfare uh, of the of its citizens i think uh, the role of uh, organizations like planning commission and niti aayog would not uh, be undermined in any way okay uh, you you mentioned niti aayog uh, you know there was this independent evaluation office which was actually the brain child of planning commission in 2014 which sent a report to the prime minister's office that we should create we should we should abolish the planning commission and create a reforms and solutions commission uh, that would be not uh, you know interfered by and there, there would be no ministerial interference in that reforms and solutions commission and it was this report that was cited by the government uh, so you know when they abolished the planning commission and created the niti aayog and critics say that they cherry picked some of the suggestions given by uh, the independent evaluation office and then created this niti aayog which is in reality another planning commission so basically it was planning commission replacing planning commission so what, what do you think about that so i'm not uh, fully aware of the whole report but uh, as the working of niti aayog i would say so uh, mostly maybe uh, in some ways because it has also been uh, created by an executive resolution so in that way it does not hold any powers like the finance commission or other uh, constitutional bodies maybe yes but sir the kind of organizational setup that niti aayog has brought with it for example uh, now we are not only working towards a five year plan but we are having a short term mid term and a long term uh, planning process and a development agenda so that aligns more towards a continuity in the policies of the government also apart from that sir the wings of niti aayog it provides a lot of uh, organize organization for example there is a technical wing then there is a planning wing where uh, there is more federal character also uh, enriched in the niti aayog today uh, the the ideas of states are also taken by niti aayog a lot more so i would say there are a lot of uh, okay uh, can you can you tell me how niti aayog ensures or promotes cooperative and competitive federalism so many of the indices are taken out by uh, niti aayog so sir uh, they 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 help in both competitive as well as cooperative federalism between the states then niti aayog assist different states with their planning and with ever kind of expertise that they require in different fields. does it all, does it also help in the startup ecosystem in india yes sir okay give me some examples of that so um one of the schemes is the atal tinkering labs and atal tinkering uh, uh, innovation mission by the niti aayog and then so there is uh, assistance that is provided to the states in their own state government schemes also okay um you you mentioned the planning process and the five year plans uh, apart from the five year plans what other type of central plans has india gone through so there were rolling plans where uh, the five year plans were not in uh, uh, could not be implemented in those years so we had what, one year what, what is a rolling plan economic so in, uh, you know uh, technically speaking technically speaking what is a rolling plan so it is a it, it is a very uh, i would say one year plans for example in 1978 to 1980 i guess there were no plans that were uh, uh, because of the coalition governments and the political instability so there were one year uh, three plans that were made uh, in a go and there was no five year plan at that time so there was no mid term strategy but only but uh, why do we call it call it a, why do we why do we call it a rolling plan so because what does it, okay uh, so sorry sir uh, so it can be transitioned into a five year plan if needed and uh, if are you it, sure are you sure about that so i'm not sure because rolling plans are also known as continuous plans so how are they continuous so i'm sorry i'm not able to recall okay uh, so my question was apart from the five year plans uh, what other types of plans we have so you mentioned rolling plans what else
I am not able to recall any other right now. Uh, are you aware of the scheme, MP Labs? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do we have anything like that uh, in the States as well? So I'm not sure, but I, I'm not sure, sir. Okay. okay, tell me, what are the most pressing economic issues that the world is facing today? So economic issues? Yes. So can I take a moment? Yeah, sure. Okay, sir. So I feel that uh, first would be the the recessionary trends that the government, uh, the world is facing uh, because of the the intricacies in the and in the linking of supply chains today, and with it the capital flight risk and uh, the the inflationary trends that are building. So I would categorize it as one one of the world problems today that we are facing. Second, I would say, sir, gender inclusivity, because we know that uh, a lot of uh, economic activities are taken out by women, and many of them are not counted, and uh, a lot of our GDP can improve, uh, if we talk country-wise also, if we include the gender aspect to it. So I think that would be the second economic problem, uh, how to account the, the role or the, the activities taken out by the women at world level. Third, I would say, sir, economic, uh, uh, sorry, environmental accounting also, sir, because uh, there is a lot of uh, challenges on the economy. A lot, for example, sir, 15% uh, uh, of our GDP, if I talk about India, is lost because of the detrimental effects that are created by air pollution or uh, any other kind of environmental degradation. So, sir, uh, that has also a bearing on the economy, which we are uh, right now not looking at very. Uh, do, 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 very do, you have any, do you have any? Do we have any index in India or any uh, method by we by which we uh, by which we calculate the loss to the environment that has happened because of our production? So, world over, the economists and international organizations are trying, but as such, we do not have uh, any. Uh, uh, we have green accounting and we can uh, take in the factors of uh, environment, but as such, they are not implemented uh, uh, in the calculation of GDP. Aren't you aware of the gross environmental product that was adopted by Uttarakhand recently? I'm sorry, sir. I'm not aware of that. Okay. You mentioned GDP. Uh, there's always a gap. Uh, when, 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 when the statistics comes out, there's, there's always a gap between what the GDP tells us about the economy and what the GVA tells us about the economy. Why is there a gap between, widening gap between GDP and GVA? So GDP talks about the gross domestic product and it means that the goods and services <clears throat> created in the territory of the country. So that is demand side way of uh, calculating uh, the uh, domestic product. Whereas uh, GVA is the gross value added, it is also a supply side way of uh, calculating GDP and it talks only about the value added. So it does not take into account, for example, sir, if I say, uh, if we take cotton, the, the uh, cotton that uh, turns into a thread that turns into a shirt. For example, the cotton was produced at 10 rupees and the thread was produced as 20 and the shirt was produced at uh, 60 rupees. So we'll not add uh, all the, uh, all the uh, money, but only the value added sector wise. So, so that is why there uh, is a difference because their uh, double counting is not there. So only the value that is added and also, sir, do, do, not... do you, do, are you saying that when, when we calculate GDP, there's a problem of double counting? No, sir. No, sir. There's no, uh, we, we have this concept of method, methodology of the GDP calculation wherein the amount you get from the expenditure method has to be equal to the amount you get from the value-added method, to the income method. So all these methods should give you the same national income. So when we calculate the value-added method, the national income, it gives us the GVA, gross value-added, which should be exactly equal to the GDP that we calculate from the expenditure method. So why is there the difference?
So maybe it is because of the taxes and the subsidies that are uh, added and subtracted. GV is calculated at which prices? So market prices. All right. Uh, can you shed some light? You should, you will study the international economics. Uh, can you shed some light on the collapse of the Bretton Woods system and the and the rise of the international monetary system? Yes, sir. So after the Second World War. Uh, so I would say uh, after the First World War, the economy, uh, First and Second World War, the economy had got into a lot of economic recession. There was economic recession seen in Europe and other parts of the world. So uh, there was uh, the system of how to now bring a, uh, a foreign exchange stability in the economy. So Bretton Woods system uh, was... Uh, uh, it it came into being where we uh, first in uh, in earlier sir we tried to peg the world currencies at gold and that gold would be pegged to the U.S. dollar so that was the system that came out as a Brit uh, as a as a, from the Bretton Woods system. So, so our uh, currencies will be pegged to gold and gold will be pegged to dollar. Sorry sir, uh, dollar is pegged to gold and our currencies are pegged to the U.S. dollar. And what so, was the exchange exchange rate of dollar into gold at that time? So it was. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not able to recall the exact figure. But then, sir, the Bretton Woods twins were born also, the IMF and the World Bank, uh, because of the to uh, further our uh, 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 process towards fina uh, foreign exchange stability. And ever since that time, sir, IMF has worked towards bringing economic stability, foreign exchange, and if there is any collapse in the any any uh, economy, then IMF comes to the rescue so that there is no uh, across the continents or across the border issues faced by that. So IMF. Can can, can, can you tell me what what is a World Bank group? Yes, sir. So it has uh, IBRD. International mm -hmm. Bank for Reconstruction of Develop uh, Developing Economies. So then I think, uh, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not able to remember the other. There, there's, an, there's an institution which is part of the World Bank Group by the name of uh, IFC. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir. International Financial uh, Commission, sir. I guess, sir. I'm sorry, sir. So, so IFC recently has come up with masala bonds. Okay, sir. Uh, elaborate on that. So masala bonds, uh, sir, are, they are sir, rupee denominated bonds. Uh, in case of India, they are rupee denominated bonds. Uh, if, for example, if any uh, foreign uh, country wants to invest uh, somewhere, rather than uh, doing that in dollars, they can do it in the uh, home country's currency. So this will in turn increase the foreign direct investments and foreign investments in different countries, sir. Uh, are are the private players uh, also eligible for uh, issue, issuing masala bonds? So I think there was uh, uh, there was some recommendation like that, but I'm not sure whether that has come into practice or not. Recently, government has issued for the first time in India sovereign green bonds. Are you aware yes, of that? Sir. Yes, sir. R RBI has okay. launched. Okay. Um, Elaborate on that. What, what are sovereign green bonds? So the word sovereign would mean um, mostly by the government. And so green bonds means which are made for environment, uh, which are taking into account the environmental consciousness. So if there are any projects that are made uh, using the environmental consciousness in mind, or if there are any, for example, sir, if there is any project for renewable energy, so that would... Uh, uh, that can suffice for uh, taking loans under sovereign uh, or or investment under sovereign green bonds. So sovereign green bonds are issued in India or outside? So they will be issued outside. Uh, you have mentioned about uh, RBI. Tell, tell me, how does RBI control the money supply in the economy? So uh, RBI has a monetary policy 
like government has its fiscal policy to maintain the credit flow in the market. So there are uh, various uh, uh, mechanisms that are used by the RBI. For example, we have the repo rate, we have reverse repo rate, we have a cash reserve ratio, statutory liquidity ratio, open market operations. There are many uh, mechanisms that are used uh, by the by the RBI to maintain, either inject or suck out the liquidity from the market. Okay, recently RBI came up for the first time with this operation known as the Operation Twist. Uh, are you aware of that? Yes, sir. Please elaborate. So it is the simultaneous sale and purchase of the government securities, sir. Uh, but I'm not too sure which one, uh, whether they purchase the long term. And so I'm, I'm little, I'm, I'm not able to remember that, sir. Okay. Uh, in the SLR, the banks have to keep a certain ratio of their NDTL into some specified assets. What are those assets? So they are a mix. Uh, they also have the, uh, they can be tertiary bills, they can be state development loans, they can be gold, uh, so all of that. So, uh, take, uh, you know, practically speaking, does RBI let the banks put their SLR in gold? So I'm not sure about that. All right. Uh, my last question regarding comes to, uh, to you is, what is a digressive taxation system? Regressive, sir? Digressive, digressive. I'm sorry, sir, I'm not aware. Okay, your optional is anthropology, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, tell me, uh, how is linguistic anthropology different from linguistics as a, as, as a science? So, uh, linguistic talks about uh, when we study the languages. So, what are the structure of languages? What is the function of languages? For example, how the grammar is used? What is the syntax? What is the lexicon? This all comes as a part of linguistics. But when we talk about linguistic anthropology, we are only trying to study how language has been utilized by man or the societies to express or, or functional utility of the language. Okay. Have you studied evolution? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are you a religious person? Sir, I would say not much, not to the uh, to the point with where it becomes ritualistic, but I think it, it has a therapeutic uh, effect on me. So it is like that. Emotional and therapeutic. Do, do you believe there is any creator to the universe who's created the entire uh, universe and what is it, whatever it is, is it in? Is it in? So this is a, a very complex kind of a question. Uh, so I, I don't believe, uh, I don't lean towards this thought much, but I don't know when the heart, there is a change of heart. So you don't believe there is a God? So as I said, I think it, it has a more emotional and therapeutic effect on me. So whenever but I... As think... a, as that, that's fine. The belief in God has a therapeutic effect. Uh, it helps you spiritually and emotionally. But as an entity, do you believe in God? Yes, sir. So I believe in God. I feel that uh, whenever I feel insecure and, and there is some kind of anxiety, so I think that there, I, I try to remember God and I try to heal myself through that. Okay, so if, if there's a God, the creator of the universe, and how do you settle that uh, issue with, with the Darwinian view of the world? So as I said, I am not uh, too leaning towards the idea that God created uh, this universe. But at the same time, sir, we could say the kind of, uh, sir, as we know, the whole evolutionary, uh, how the evolution must have happened from a single cell bacteria to varied kind of life that is uh, there today. But at the same time, sir, if we talk about of, uh, of how these miraculous uh, interventions have happened, maybe there is some divine uh, power that's working, but I'm not very... Uh, leaning towards that thought. I think... Okay. Uh, what, are, what are the drawbacks of the Darwinian theory of evolution? 
So Darwin talked about natural selection and how the origin of species happened. So, uh, so I think uh, survival of the fittest and the ideas were very novel at that time. And uh, but at the same time, sir, how the man has manipulated the environment around it. So I think that was a miscalculation on the part of Darwin that it's not only survival of the fittest or or how the arrival of the fittest has happened now today man being not very uh, powerful as a creature but also has tried to dominate the world and is successful successfully reproducing despite there are so many odds against it so that manipulation the technological aspect i think was miscalculated in his theories do you think that his uh, you know conception about the origin of life on earth uh, has led to um, the new atheistic revolution that we have in the world right now? So it could be possible. But he himself was a believer in God. So uh, Darwin's theories today are taken as very scientific. So maybe there is a clash when it comes to science and uh, religion. So maybe mm -hmm. it develops from there. Because when we talk about science, sir, it is a very logical and it talks about the causal and effect relationships. The uh, there, is a, there is no fallacy of affirming the consequent. So there is, it's very logical, sir. But when we talk about religion, sir, and, and uh, science talks about naturalistic phenomena, something that we can, uh, if we do an experiment for suppose, it has to come with a very universal result. So, sir, religion is different than that because it talks about supernatural and beliefs in supernatural beings. So, <clears throat> I think there is that conflict that comes with it. How, how, where do you see yourself? Do you, do, do you more so tend towards the naturalistic idea of the universe or somehow which is related to the consciousness of the universe as well? Sir, I would say that... Uh, for the creation of universe, I would say I lean more towards the scientific idea of it. But sir, if I have to talk that, sir, religion is very important because it, it gives us morality. It gives us that consciousness of right and wrong. So for that aspect, I would say I lean towards religion, but creation of universe, I would say, sir, science. So what is the black swan problem in science? I'm not sure about that. Can you shed some light on the comparative anatomy of man and apes? Yes, sir. So, man uh, diverged from the line of ape around some 1.6 million years to 2, 2 million years ago. So, uh, sir, there's a lot. Sir, did you say compare comparison between the two? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, so I think uh, there is a lot of similarity as well as divergence between the two. For example, the 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 cranial part and and the postcranial features, most of them are very similar uh, to that of the ape. But sir, when we talk about the divergence, there is uh, sir the 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 brain has developed a lot more. So the cranial capacity has improved and the the jaw size has reduced the prognathism on the face has reduced. So the uh, the size has reduced. We have now become more bipedal as compared to the arboreal uh, uh, parentage. So, sir, uh, similarities, sir, I would say that uh, even uh, today, even they have a lot of uh, similarity with us uh, with the use of the hands. So they can also use their hands, uh, like not with that precision, but they can also use, so the, uh, there is that. The digits of the hands and the feet, the feet anatomy, hand anatomy is more or less similar. Then the sir, uh, so. Okay, fine. Uh, give me three of the biggest problems that the tribal communities in India are facing right now. So can I just recollect my thoughts? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, well, there are many uh, intricate issues that are faced by tribals, but uh, if I have to rate any three, I would say 
sir exploitation and poverty would be one second mm-hmm. would be sir i would say the industrial nomadism and uh, that labor uh, the kind of uh, labor intensive work that they are doing that would be second and third would be sir um, the the health related issues and how uh, would anthropology help us in tribal development so anthropology has always mastered the studies of tribal uh, tribe tribes and through its action in applied anthropology we have seen a lot of success also and a lot of work that has been done in the tribal issues uh, for example sir there was a khaka committee which talked talked about a lot how to utilize uh, the tribals into the mainstream and sir there has been long debates uh whether it was the varier elvin debate or whether uh, when the tribal sub plan came it was the brain child of the anthropologist so these are all uh, the mada approach the cluster development approach the fifth and sixth six schedule of the constitution of india they are all the works that have been primarily done by the tribal anthropologist who have worked in this uh, field okay uh what is cognitive anthropology so cognitive anthropology talks about the cognition or the unraveling the human mind and what uh, and how humans see interpret things around them so it came in the late 19th uh, 20th century and mm-hmm. and it it uh, it take took the subject more from a materialistic aspect to the non material aspect for example uh, earlier uh, theories were more based upon the visible cultures for example the evolutionist theory how uh, the transition from savage to being barbaric or civilized happened but in cognition we were talking more about the inherent uh values belief systems of the cultures and how they were responsible for uh, framing or ev- evolving of the cultures okay so aprajita aprajita yes sir aprajita okay you, you your hobby is debating and what what did you mention earlier so dancing and uh, working out dancing and what kind of dance forms uh, have you studied and have you acted in so i have uh, learned kathak sir shed some light on the origins of kathak so kathak's origin dates back to the mahabharat the times of mahabharata so that time sir it was uh, it used to be a village Uh, kind of a dance where the villagers used to move around and used to tell the stories so kathak also means kathakars and it is come from the word kathakars which means storytelling and sir then the, in in the ancient times it became a temple dance with the not uh, with the uh, with the religious aspect being uh, involved into it and when sir it it uh, when the mughal era came it got a lot more persian eyes and persian elements got infused so so the grace and the poise that is there and the sufi elements also got involved with it so so in the bhakti times it was also used in the sufi times it was also used and then sir in the british times there were uh, no um, support that was given by the state so so it became a lot more localized that is where the idea of gharanas came in so the three gharanas the jaipur lucknow and banaras came at that time and so i would say after the independence the the right kind of support has been given to the art form and now it is supported uh, and and so it is one of the eight classical dances and the only one from north india since you also like debating uh you know can you uh, talk for I'll give you a topic. Just talk, talk, talk on it until I stop you. Fine. Yes, sir. Animals should also enjoy same human rights. So, can I take a moment, please? Sure. Okay, sir. Please start. 
so um as we have evolved in the history uh, i would say the world has become a lot from the ecological perspective to more anthropocentric perspective where man has achieved on the ladder of hierarchy on the top it has come on as the apex uh, predator so uh, sir there is when we need that more holistic approach because uh, as we if only talk about from the anthropological uh, uh, anthropol anthropocentric view humans only talk about their own benefits so if we talk about that also we need that kind of diversity in the world because if the food chain in that way gets uh, destroyed it will come on the survival of the man but having said so this is just a anthropocentric view point of that animal rights are also important because sir we are not only the one that are living in this world we are much like other uh, diverse organisms that are there in this world so we should not look at the world from only anthropocentric view but man is just a part of the larger social fine fine uh, tell me what is the what is your family background so my um, we are a family of five people my parents my brother and my bhabhi sir my parents are doctors my brother is a civil servant sir my bhabhi is also a doctor so is so your mother and father both are doctors yes sir so why 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 did you go for medicine as such why join civil services sir the initial inspiration came from my maternal uncle he was an ias officer so it started from there and it got even more pronounced when my brother got into services so so i think that is where i derived my inspiration from having said so sir uh, i also have great respect for doctors but i at that time my parents gave me that choice that open choice to choose my career so i think i leaned more towards the idea of civil services do you think you will be selected so i don't know whether uh, i i would be selected or not but i'll surely try so you okay, tell me three reasons why should we select you so i feel that uh, whether it is me or anybody else they should be selected on their merit and so if i if i qualify in that merit i would be selected having said so i think sir i i am a blend of a of a Uh, of a person who should have the the traits that are required to be a civil servant for example so i am I'm, i'm a very hard working and a dedicated person i'm a decision maker and an empathetic person sir and and over the years sir i'm trying to develop in me the characters and traits that should should uh, be good to be a civil servant okay mujhe apne bare mein bataiye aapki सबसे बड़ी कमजोरी कौन सी है सर सबसे बड़ी कमजोरी जी सर कभी कभी मैं बहुत परफेक्शन के चक्कर में ना सर जो एक गुड होता है ना उसको इग्नोर कर देती हूँ जैसे मतलब बहुत हमेशा ये ट्राई करती हूँ कि चीजें परफेक्ट होनी चाहिए तो कभी कभी अच्छे को भी इग्नोर कर देती हूँ उसके चक्कर और सर उस चक्कर उस चक्कर में तो आप काफी डिफिकल्ट हो जाएंगे लोगों के साथ आपके आपके साथ काम करने के लिए सर मैं बाकियों को लेकर ऐसी नहीं हूँ बस अपने आप को लेकर थोड़ी ज्यादा वैसे हूँ ज्यादा किसी को ऐसे नहीं करती हूँ चलिए ठीक है इतने सारे इंटरव्यूज किए मैंने इतना बड़ा इंटरव्यू किसी का नहीं किया है 
because I really enjoyed your opinions or just like you said, you have a very balanced approach, almost well researched. You are, let me say, you have done a lot of research on your own and done a lot of research. And it was very good. I thought that when I was studying the economy, I would keep it on the side of the side. You have a very, very good knowledge about every, every issue that I have asked you. We'll start from the beginning. आपका इंट्रोडक्शन वाज गुड जो इंट्रोडक्शन के की चीजें होनी चाहिए वो आपने सब बताई अपना नाम बैचलर्स मास्टर्स हॉबीज वगैरह तो यही इंटरव्यू का स्ट्रक्चर होता है यू गो विद द नेम देन योर एजुकेशन देन जनरली वी टॉक अबाउट द वर्क एक्सपीरियंस व्हिच इन योर केस वी डोंट हैव देन वी टॉक अबाउट इंटरेस्ट इन हॉबी सो दैट्स फाइन बहुत ही क्रिस्प था काफी अच्छा था उसके बाद निकनेम्स में आपने भी वो ठीक से बोला यूरिन ब्लैकआउट आर्यन वाला क्वेश्चन भी आपने अच्छे से संभाला गांधी जी के रिलेटेड बिल्कुल वही जवाब आपने दिया जो उसका जवाब है जैसे आपने वाइडेंस और कवर्डेस को आपस में कंपेयर किया इट वाज वेरी गुड चेंज ऑफ हार्ट आपने बोला कि लेटर ऑन ही हैड चेंज ऑफ हार्ट एंड दैट दैट इस � that you gave, uh, you know, the, the, these people in Africa, they, they, they tell us that you gave us a lawyer and we gave you a Mahatma. Okay, so that was the change of heart that happened. So you, you answered that very well. Ambedkar Sahab, aapne bola to, wo achha tha, mi mene deliberately Ambedkar bola. I just wanted you to repeat that. Or wo galti ho jati agar aap Ambedkar bol dete sirf. To aapne Sahab laga to, that was good. Mother tongue, Dovi ki baare mein, very good knowledge. हर जगह पर मेरे बहुत अच्छा लगा कुछ चीजें ऐसी हैं जो मैं चाहूँगा आप आप स्पेक्स लगाते हो सब पहले लगाती थी अब नहीं आप आपके आपके वर्ड्स काफी सटी होते हैं वैसा कभी भी इन इन डी एंटायर ड्यूरेशन मुझे कभी भी नहीं लगा यू नो यू सिर्फ समथिंग दैट एक्चुअली मैं थोड़ा उसमें ऑफेंड हो जाऊँ मैंने लास्ट के क्वेश्चन को हिंदी में पूछा और आपने अच्छे से हिंदी में ही जवाब दिया वो भी काफी अच्छा था बिकॉज़ दे वुड स्टिक टू द मीडियम दैट यू हैव दे वुड चेंज द लैंग्वेज वो भी काफी ठीक था एक ही चीज अब इस पूरे में जो मुझे एक ही चीज लगी देखिए मैंने आपको इतने सारे क्वेश्चंस पू कि ठीक है सुनी पता तो ठीक है सब सब कुछ तो नहीं पता होगी किसी को भी पर जहाँ जहाँ पर आपने गलत जवाब दिया वो मुझे याद है जैसे आपने जीवी जीडीपी में यू यू गिव रॉंग रॉंग आंसर तो फिर मैंने कहा जीवी कहाँ पर निकाला जाता है आपने बोला मार्केट प्राइस मुझे याद रहा मार्केट प्राइस पे नहीं � and GDP is measured at market price, GVA is measured at basic price. So that, that makes the difference. So you have said wrong, but I remember that. Likewise, I asked a ruling plan. You have tried, you give a wrong answer. The ruling plans are annual plans. Uh, they are not annual plans. The ruling plan of India was an annual plan. But the ruling plan technically speaking, there are three plans inside a ruling plan. There are a prospectus, there is a plan, there is a ruling plan for the long term, there is a prospective plan for the long term, there are three plans inside a ruling plan. There is a prospective plan for the long term, then there's a medium term plan and then there's an annual plan. So there's three plans. And why do we call it a rolling plan? Because the plan never ends. Our perspective plan was, let's say, let's say the perspective plan was for 10 years, from 2020 to 30. As soon as the next year comes, it will be from 21 to 31. Then 22 to 32. So it's a continuous rollover. And every year we can roll it, addition, subtraction. That is why it is known as a continuous plan. That's right. Uh, आप बार थे, Can I take a moment? Then you came up with a very good answer. ऐसा लगता था that you, आपने जो moment लिया उसका सही इस्तेमाल किया और अच्छा जवाब दिया. So that was good. You have a very good smile as well. मुझे नहीं लगता. I don't think that uh, you know they'll have any option to not select you. You're a perfect candidate for this job. I, I, अगर आपका means अच्छा गया है, जो कि I expect कि अच्छा गया होगा. Uh, I don't think that you know they, 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 they'll, they'll have any reason to not select you. You're, you're a brilliant candidate. Thank you, sir. If sir, you have any questions, you can ask. Yes, sir. First of all, sir, I would want to thank you, sir. Uh, your uh, YouTube uh, videos has also helped. Uh, it gives me a lot of uh, happiness when I see you. And uh, the kind of feedback you and the kind of uh, effort that you take to uh, mentor everyone, I think that's commendable. And, uh, sir, I was really looking forward to your feedback. 
also say if uh, you were to be that uh, the chairperson how many marks would you give me <laughs> i you see i really enjoyed it uh, mujhe lagta hai on the higher and only I'll, i'll give you higher marks in interview because you're a very pleasant personality very pleasant uh, marks agar means ka ka acha hai i think this is your year aapka pehla attempt hai matlab sir uh, 2018 mein i uh, i did take the exam but tabhi just masters se nikli thi to tabhi prelims nahi hua tha nahi yahi wala aapka attempt hai i i think so they they'll if if they don't select you Uh, it's not going to be a uh, a loss for you it is going to be a loss for the administration that's what i can tell you which means a lot so thank you so much really okay uh, we pray to god that we'll see you in the finalists and hope so we'll talk again after that yes sir sure sir okay. all the best thank you sir